am I missing? It seems to me the college is a higher affluence area. There's lots of housing, mm -hmm. lots of businesses. What what am I missing? Why is it right? So so uh, this um, theme that we're looking at right now is the housing transportation theme, right? Composed of large apartment buildings, mobile homes, crowding, no vehicle, and group quarters. So you can imagine when you have a large population of students, and we actually have another map that just shows you the population of students, um, uh, that as a percentage of that census tract, how many people live in large apartment buildings? A dorm is going to qualify as a large apartment right. building, right? How many people don't have a vehicle? Um, the measure on crowding is housing units with more than one person per room, right? So, so, um, so social vulnerability is, a, is um, not the term I was. Yeah. It doesn't mean what I thought it meant. It, it, <laughs> In this case, and, and because um, large populations of college-aged uh, adults can skew things in that way. Um, that's why we have a, a, a map that's just strictly of that, so that you can see which are those communities that might be getting thrown off because of the presence of a college age uh, population. It's not that granular. The data is not that granular. What's 57% college age and percent living in poverty is interestingly Almost twenty percent, <laughs> just because their parents had money. On student support, <laughs> we're not in Middlebury. Seth, did you have a question? Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was still going on. Oh. So, um, <laughs> as far as the data between the the uh, census uh, and the annual stuff. I think what I'm hearing is that the annual uh, report gives you uh, greater depth of data, but the census gives you a larger sample size. Is that That's kind of right. what you're saying? That's right. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we move on to health heat vulnerability? Um, yes. Yeah. So I noted that you have. Um, had the good fortune to have interns mm -hmm. updating this. Yeah. Uh, that does make me a little nervous, though, about whether or not it's a consistent, um, or if it's just something that you're interested in doing, or if it's something that you're kind of compelled to do. That's an astute observation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so environmental public health tracking has uh, nationally consistent data and measures that the CDC requires us to host locally. And those include you know, a, a dozen different types of cancer uh, at the county and sub-county level, lots of hospitalization data, environmental data on air quality and water quality. Social vulnerability index is not one of those required data sets. Same would be true of like the cyanobacteria tracker, the tick tracker. Um, those are tools that we've developed because we think that you know there's a, a local interest or a local demand. That said, it, it's not um, uh, critical to the functioning of the program. We're not required to do it. And a lot of the most interesting work that we do is um, powered by the, the sweat equity of the interns uh, who, who come and work with us because you know, we've got the work that we're required to do, um, but there might be some interesting project. Um, and if you get someone who's very capable and can do that kind of work, it, it, it's a real uh, blessing and a, a real value um, uh, for the health department. And the GIS manager, both Pete and now the new GIS manager, Dan Jarvis, have been really good about having a pipeline of, of capable GIS interns to come in and do that work. But if they weren't there, um, yeah, it, 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 it would not happen unless, um, you know, we were required to do it or some other, we had some other way of having the capacity to do it. Okay. So, but the institutional knowledge of how to do it does exist outside of your interns? There's just no man. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to retain it because the interns don't overlap. Um, 
and so we've got you know good documentation on how to how to do the updates. Thank you. Yeah. For sure. Um, and and I wasn't able to find the uh, college age map uh, uh, at the tip of my fingers, but I'll also send that one uh, around too. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, Jared Ulmer, Climate and Health Program Manager at the Department of Health. Um, I can keep this pretty brief because um, this builds a lot on what David has already conveyed um, and just keep more time for, for questions. But um, similar to what David was just saying, this is something that was um, a project that was completed by the same intern initially um, as a kind of a proof of concept of how do we take the social vulnerability index as kind of a foundation and apply that to a specific climate related health hazard. Um, so, so essentially what we were able to, to do was choose social vulnerability index layers that were, were clearly related to risk for heat illnesses and then add in other data sources that we could find that also related to um, heat related risk. So we added um, a, a bunch of different health related factors from some of our, um, our, our yearly behavioral risk factor surveillance survey that's conducted in Vermont um, that gives us information about um, current health conditions and health status. Um, we added some environmental characteristics uh, related to um, ur urban characteristics, essentially how much impervious surface is there, how much tree cover is there, because um, you know in places that have less trees and more hard surface, temperatures tend to feel uh, hotter. Um, we added some data about um, the frequency that people experience uh, heat uh, or around Vermont um, and found counterintuitively that um, places in Vermont that experience the, the least frequent heat tended to experience the most frequent um, heat health impacts, which we attribute to um, kind of lack of adaptation in terms of just our, our bodies need to acclimate to warmer temperatures, our buildings, um, uh, are only designed with air conditioning in places that experience frequent enough heat to warrant it. Um, and then we also incorporated some data about the actual um, the emergency department visits for heat related uh, impacts that we've experienced in, in recent years um, and, and stacked those on top of some of those social vulnerability layers. Um, so you can see on the screen here uh, both the map and sort of how we categorize our um, 17 different uh, indicators. We grouped them a little bit differently than for the, the social vulnerability index um, into six different categories. And I should, I, I won't get into the weeds unless you want to know more about this, but we use somewhat different analytical methods for creating this index. Instead of the, the flagging of um, census tracts, um, we, we did this at the city and town level and everything is kind of on a, on a continuous scale. So um, we're, looking at, um, we're, we're looking at relative risks for every town compared to the average uh, in Vermont and, um, and, and sort of adding, putting those in the same quantitative scale and adding them together. So there's a lot more like, behind the scenes um, computation that's going on here, um, which is, I think, both a strength and a weakness of this, as I'll, I'll mention. Um, so what you're seeing here is not based on flags, but it's, it's, almost, it's almost more of a ranking of um, every city and town compared relatively uh, against the, the average risk um, for heat illnesses in Vermont. So the blues you see are the places in Vermont that we found the, the least um, risk factors for heat illnesses, and the reds are the places that we found the, the highest risk for heat illnesses. Um, you're probably asking, why is the Northeast Kingdom um, coming up the most red, um, which was sort of a surprise to us as well. Um, but we found that, that a lot of the, the underlying risk factors, um, socioeconomic status, pre-existing health conditions, um, high percentage of older adults, those tended to be um, some of the most critical risk factors for the, for the Northeast, and actually did find in our um, historic data that 
many of the, the communities in the Northeast have experienced higher rates of heat illnesses per capita um, than other parts of the state. Um, we also found urbanized areas were generally at higher risk. A lot of that was because of the environmental characteristics, um, less tree canopy, more hard surfaces, also uh, in some of those lower um, socioeconomic status. Um, and in contrast, places like Chittenden County, Windsor, and to some extent Wyndham um, were at lower risk, um, largely due to higher socioeconomic status um, and sort of lower prevalence of pre-existing health conditions that put people at higher risk for, for heat illnesses. Um, I'm just going to flip to the back of this. This two-pager is um, should have been shared with you and is on our website. But this just kind of breaks down our our six themes of, of indicators, so you can see how some of those vary. Um, you also note that some of, for some of these indicators, we had city and town level data, um, so the population, environmental, socioeconomic data. A lot of that was census data, or for some of the environmental ones, we had satellite data or something that's you know even more granular than census data. So those we could use, we could display at the city and town level, whereas a lot of our health data um, and temperature data and heat emergency data, we, don't, we could only get that at the county level or in some instances you can see where we were able to um, go a little bit more local uh, where the data allowed us to. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued in the lack of overlap. Between the different themes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, I mean, the, with the exception of you know the, the kingdom. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that's where you see the most overlap, um, which then you know shows up in our our overall theme pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's not a lot of obvious um, pattern in in some of these or um, overlap between the themes. We can't see the urbanized areas very well at this scale without you know blowing it way up. But you do see you know a little bit more of kind of consistency across. Um, across some of the more urbanized communities. Um, it's kind of hard to tell at this level, but. So the slide before that, mm -hmm. there's an area in the Northeast Kingdom that's hatched, and if you look at the, the legend, it says population is less than six persons. Really? <laughs> really? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> less than six persons in an entire area up there? Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah, I think they didn't have it. I think there are three or four. You gotta get this kingdom there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, that's, County. That's, that's remote. I might have to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Battery operated plane. No. But the the one thing that this analytical method let us do, which I think is a, a bit of a strength, is um, to provide oops, to provide a little bit more of a, a granular overall index, um, where we can see. You know, if, if there were communities that were kind of like 80th percentile on a lot of things on the social vulnerability index, they wouldn't get flagged at all. But if you were at 80% um, risk across the board for all the indicators, that you know stacks up um, to, to larger risk. So th this method can capture um, the accumulation of kind of moderate levels of risk um, versus the SVI, which which only captures high levels of risk for the indicators. With the downside, as I was mentioning, that this is a lot more challenging to develop. Um, you can see our May 2016 date up in the top right corner. We created this initially, have not updated it, largely because of the level of effort required um, to update it. It's also a little more challenging to communicate about. Um, David mentioned how simple it is to communicate about the flags, where they come from, how they stack. Um, this is a lot more challenging because there's a lot of math going on on the, the back end of it. Um, so we actually are getting ready to update this in 2020, but we're going to, this is kind of a, a proof of concept when we did it and we wanted to try a different method. Um, but after using this for a few years, we're going to go to a method very similar to the social vulnerability index method so we can do regular updates and hopefully communicate it about it a, a little bit easier than we can with this. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention just about how how it's been used. Oh, yeah. So this is going to sound a little flip and maybe a little silly, but why are you updating it in 2020? Um, For what reason? 
Are you updating it? Sure. Part of it's just because it's been four years, so it's been on our mind that some of this data is getting somewhat dated. Um, we have some extra capacity in our program right now um, uh, that we haven't had before, so um, we, we have more ability to do this than uh, in, in previous years. Um, some of it is related to some of what I spoke about a couple weeks ago with the, the heat wave in 2018 and um, the impacts from that heat wave and all of the um, increased emphasis on preparedness for, for heat um, getting a lot of attention. It seems like um, a, a topic that's getting so much attention, we don't want to be um, we don't want to be sharing older data if at all possible. Um, you know, we want to be able to use the, the latest and greatest data. There's a lot of um, detailed data that we got from um, about health impacts from that heat wave that aren't incorporated here. Um, the, those data will become available this year that we can incorporate in. Um, so those are a couple of the reasons. Data. Um, historically, it's been a challenge to kind of go out and extract data. Um, with the current big data, um, you know, Facebook, all that sort of stuff, yeah. it, they'll sell information to anybody. Would it be more efficient to kind of compile a list? I, I mean, if Facebook can overhear you talking about, uh, you know, picking up a box of tissues on the way home and then, you know, five seconds later you get an ad for uh, Puffs Plus or whatever, <laughs> um, there's obviously some data there. Would something like that be uh, helpful to, you know, more rapidly and hopefully more accurately um, portray the entire state yeah. more often? Um, it's a really interesting question. I'd probably mostly defer to, to David on this one. The one thing I can mention is that we, and I'm not sure how um, place specific we can get with it, but we do use Google Analytics to some extent to try to. Um, mostly just experimentally to see how we can track people searching for um, uh, how to remove a tick or you know something like that. Uh, mostly to check seasonal patterns um, and some of these uh, some of these impacts. We haven't tried to drill down spatially much. I'm not sure how, how much we can do that, um, but that's that's one lead we could pursue um, on the the purchasing data. I'll just say that our resources are certainly um, little to none for supporting a lot of this. Our labor is, is our, our most significant resource, so um, there would be challenges for us to, to be able to purchase data. Is that something that's come up in the environmental public health tracking conversations? Um, no. Uh, we haven't pursued uh, pulling in um, uh, social network type data. I mean, the way that we're getting the census data is we have a script that pulls it automatically from the Census Bureau. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a pretty huge labor saving there because you're not downloading individual data sets. Um, so that's, that's relatively efficient and, you know, could even potentially be automated um, so that you wouldn't necessarily have to be doing it uh, to manually each year. Um, I know that at UVM, Chris Danforth is doing uh, research, like complex systems research, to look at indicators of health and happiness by doing um, analysis of, like, you know, the words that are getting used on Twitter. Um, so, you know, people have, have definitely done work like that to look at um, disease outbreaks based on the types of searches that, that people are doing. It's not been something that we've pursued in track. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, um, especially now that you're back in the room. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, just about how we've used this, because I know that was one of your, your questions. Um, and I would say when we created this initially, like I said, it's kind of a proof of concept. We didn't have a clear application in mind at the time. Um, but we, we have found this to be useful for supporting uh, an energy saving trees program that we partner with the urban and community forestry program on. And it's, it's kind of a, it's an Arbor Day national program that we help sponsor and deliver um, with the forestry folks. Um, 
and it's intended to help people um, with planting trees near their home, either to increase shade or increase windbreak and lower their energy bills. We've, we've also sort of taken the approach of, um, well, a lot of people don't have energy, cooling energy bills in the summer, but these trees will still help increase shade and keep homes from, from getting, uh, getting warmer. Um, so we've, uh, we've been working on this program with forestry since 2017 and have targeted towards the communities that rate at the highest level of risk on the, the heat vulnerability index and then also relate in the highest category of risk on the environmental theme of the heat vulnerability index. Um, so we've delivered this program in Newport, Bennington, Rutland, Barrie, and St. Albans, um, and it's provided about a thousand trees to, those, to, to just the urban cores of those communities. Um, Residents are able to sign up and um, and reserve one or two trees and are kind of guided through a process of where to most efficiently plant the tree. Um, so this is has been directly related to that. Um, I would say mostly we've used it just as an educational tool to be able to help communicate about heat-related risk factors. Um, I use this in a lot of presentations um, and and use it to just illustrate um, how we identify. Uh, risk factors for specific climate-related health outcomes and how those risk factors then can drive the strategies for, you know, if it's an urbanized area, maybe it's environmental solutions, if it's the North, Northeast Kingdom, um, maybe there are home modification or um, neighbor, check on neighbor um, kind of safety solutions that we need to be thinking about. Do you, know, um, do you know if there's any requirement across state government um, to kind of highlight uh, vulnerability um, for the different populations that are served by the different agencies and departments? So is this something that we would find if we started probing all the different agencies, like some element of these places are um, in the biggest trouble or have you know, the most need of repair. Right. Um, I don't think there's, I'm not aware of requirements. Um, that The use of tools like this has definitely become more common in the last few years. The Social Vulnerability Index, I think, is pretty w widely used. Um, I know the CDC has a national Social Vulnerability Index as well that's available for anybody, um, even if you haven't created a state-specific one. Um, some of these tools like the Heat Vulnerability Index, a lot of the state climate and health programs are using. That only covers 16 states, though. Um, but a lot of the climate and health programs have been encouraged, but not required, to develop these. Can you say that again about the 16 states? Yeah, there's 16 states and two cities that are funded by the CDC, like ours, um, to support a climate and health program at their health departments. And one of our, um, it's not a requirement, but the, the CDC asks us to consider developing tools like vulnerability indices to help um, help demonstrate the spatial variability of, of risk within our communities. So we've all been kind of dabbling with these. And so is that um, information from other states easily accessible? Do you have that information? Or could you point us to a place where we could see that information? Yeah, I, I don't have it at the, my fingertips, but I could certainly go back and find a few examples to send to you. So to hone in on what Laura was just talking about, um, you said it's this kind of tool is more widely used now or becoming more widely used. Who uses it? I, I mean, what I'm aware of is mostly just through these other climate health programs at, at health departments that have used it for, um, for heat, for um, flooding risks, um, uh, some, some air pollution risks. Um, so I think they have, some, some of these other states have used these, um, again, largely as a communication education tool, but also the hope is these are places that we're identifying that need more resources to, to mitigate um, whatever the climate-related health risk is. So, you know, with the Energy Saving Trees program, for example, um, if we can find the communities that are going to most benefit from that strategy by using a, a tool like this that gives us a better starting place, then... Um, you know, other, other information that we might have available. Can I piggyback on Jared's answer? Um, in terms of who's using it, uh, another group that I know is using 
social vulnerability index uh, and has expressed an interest in the heat vulnerability index um, is a, a group of community advocates and researchers. Um, they're calling themselves Rejoice. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it includes Vermont Law School, uh, which has stood up an environmental justice clinic. Um, the <laughs> environmental justice is the EJ. Um, uh, let's see who else is part of it. Uh, UVM, um, Toxics Action Center, I think that Healthy Communities Foundation. Um, so what they're trying to do is understand what does environmental justice mean in the context of a rural state like Vermont. And so they've been conducting these um, environmental justice community panels around the state to talk to um, people who you know, usually don't necessarily have much of a voice um, about uh, what are the environmental stressors that, that they're dealing with in their lives. They are paying for transportation, they're providing childcare, they're providing dinner in order to you know, try to encourage people to come who otherwise might not. Um, there's uh, one of these community uh, panels is happening tonight at the Gateway Center in Newport um, from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, so the, the folks, Bindu Panikar is the uh, UVM professor who's contributing to it. She's trying to develop an environmental justice index sort of similar to the stuff that, that you've seen today. Um, so, uh, and they're very interested in the question of rural Vermont and how they are adversely affected by either environmental uh, pollution or climate change, um, and it might be an interesting uh, group to speak to. Um, one of their tool maybe I'll mention quickly, which relates to one of your earlier questions. Um, there, there's an organization in Vermont called Community Resilience Organizations that developed a community resilience assessment tool um, that that looks at, um, it's like kind of like a community self-assessment on how prepared the community is both for impacts of climate change and for um, taking action to, to address climate change. It's probably only been used in 10 to 20 communities in Vermont. Um, it's a pretty small program. So it's not a great statewide comprehensive data source, but it, it really gets at some of the questions you were asking earlier that kind of go beyond what we can um, demonstrate through something like the, the Vulnerability Index. Who's, who's 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 organization? Organization? Yeah. Community Resilience Organizations. Um, the director is Mindy Blank. Well, yeah. Who they presented. Um, there's a, there's a resiliency study group, and you know, it's actually part of the Climate Caucus okay. that has actually been convening around rural communities, and, and I think that that group presented to that. I didn't attend it, but okay. 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 And that tool is online, too. I can send that as follow. I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah that would be great. And it gets to that question of like, what what is the right thing to be measuring when you're talking about like social cohesion or social isolation? Those aren't, you know, explicit variables in the census data. Um, so so how do you capture information? And one other caveat that I would put on um, social vulnerability index is what you're looking at is the 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 worst top ten percent for any of those indicators relative to the rest of how Vermont is doing, right? So if you wanted to compare data from, say, 2013 to 2018, there's still going to be a worst top 10% because you're comparing to how the rest of the state is doing at that time. So if, let's say, the whole state improved uniformly, that wouldn't be reflected because the, the same top 10% would still look like they're, they're the worst top 10%. And so in order to do sort of those longitudinal comparisons, you, you would need to change the methodology so that you had a fixed baseline that you were comparing against. So you could have more sort of absolute values to see how you changed over time. Because this is really a relative indicator of how you compare to the rest of the state. Thank you, that's important. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the absolute values are in there. When I clicked on a, a census track and it popped up and showed you. Yeah. There you go.